Good afternoon. Thank you for tuning in to JCI Live Austin, Texas, USA. I'm Mari Gandy. Today, we have a lot of news that's going on. And I've, I've been watching these um, programs about families that were adopted back like my age and older even before the abortions were becoming popular and uh, the emptiness that goes on in so many people who have adopted out their children is, um, I mean, every day they talk about how hard it has been. A lot of times it's younger girls that um, became pregnant before, you know, it, at age 16 or so, and or 14 even, and, and their parents had them uh, give up the babies, <clears throat> and they had no contact with them. And the emptiness that they had is uh, just really staggering. This week we got the uh, Choose Life Plates, JCI Dash, Dash Gandy is our license plates here in Texas, and you can go to choose dot dash life.org to get license plates like that choosing life is really important it's um several years ago we had uh oh, several many people come into our programs and talked about <laughs> already yet John. a lot of people talk uh that have talked about the emptiness that they have had in their lives since they chose abortion and uh being a parent is like the most wonderful thing that you can ever have. It's There's just so much love, uh, so much joy in life and God and family. And, and these are things, attributes that God chooses. And uh, I choose to talk to the Christian audience here in Austin. That's why we have Channel 11. And I've been talking to God about that. You know, why? what do you want me to do? And I, I try to do what my husband did when he was here as the host and report news that was going on. And, and he would have guests or we would have guests. And, and um, <clears throat> I think just God was just showing me to be a watchman like in Ezekiel 3.17, where God tells Ezekiel he wants him to be a watchman to Israel. And I believe that God is wanting me and my audience to be a watchman because it's becoming more and more, there's becoming more and more darkness in the world. People don't understand. They don't know. They don't read the Bible like you do. And that's what God is wanting us to be as a watchman because the things that are going on are imp impacting our life. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do here is to let you know what's going on so that you can be a watchman. So well, I ran across this video clip from October 2013 with J. Craig Gandy talking about our government doing uh, fraudulent things. He also mentions... Uh, the uh, Israel, not Israel, Germany, Merkel, and what with her coming in to the White House last week, I just thought it was his wisdom even back then is still timely today. And I just wanted to sh start the program with that. Well, thank you for coming back. Uh, you know, there's a lot going on in the world. Uh, Maury's, uh, you know, talking about the pro life movement. There's pro life movement going on throughout the world, too. There are a lot of people. Uh, that are having an agenda forced down their throat to legalize abortion, to legalize same-sex marriages in countries throughout the world. But these countries, these nations are fighting. You know, as we dangle dollars in front of the people's noses to uh, make their uh, changes to their laws and constitutions, we're having some kickback. And our nation is uh, looked at as the bad guy when we go in trying to promote our uh, anti-God agendas in some nations that are primarily God. You know, I look at uh, leaders of the world such as, uh, you know, President Goodluck Jonathan out of Nigeria, President out of Uganda who's lifted his nation to, to God. You know, uh, 
Prime Minister Netanyahu out of Israel. It's extremely intelligent man. Angela Merkel out of Germany, who is, uh, I've always uh, respected the stand she's taken, especially during the past five years, the banking crisis, where it looked like she was the only level head on a global um, platform. You know, the decisions she made strengthened Germany as we were making idiotic decisions back in 2007 and 8 and 9 and 10, 11 and 12 and now into 13. You know, and we're facing those problems. You know, as the banks have gotten richer and richer and, uh, you know, we sometimes wonder, well, why has this occurred? It's because we the people have been silent. We've not prayed in these situations. We've seen the things that come and people want to close their ears and close their eyes to the truth. You know, I look at the National Security Agency and people all over the world are, are up in arms against the United States for all the spying and all the, you know, listening, tapping into phones. And you say, well, why is this going on? It's because we have not been maintaining a close, vigilant eye on our government. Our government is really uh, a lot of people angry at the United States of America right now. And rightly so. You know, Angela Merkel out of Germany was saying, what's the NSA doing tapping my cell phone? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense to me. Why, you know, we can say, well, it's looking for terrorists and doing all this. But you know, really the, uh, um, the truth of the matter is, is that it doesn't make sense as to what goes on. I look at the whistleblowers that have, you know, the Snowdens and the Mannings and all these people, and they say, oh, these people are, are evil. These people are anti-American. Yet I watch a movie with Denzel Washington with uh, called Safe House, where they're, you know, the whole end of the movie was about turning evidence and to over to the uh, media so that those that were doing bad things could be pers or prosecuted. And you say, what is the difference? In our movies glorify those that make the right decision, yet in reality we toss them in prison. And I say, I don't understand. You know, when our government is doing fraudulent things, when our government is doing things that aren't right, and we're not making those, we're not standing with those that are that are blowing the whistle. You know, if I see fraud, waste, and abuse in government, and I don't report it, then I'm participating in the fraud, waste, and abuse. And I remember 25, 30 years ago now, it was 85, 84, so almost 30 years ago now, as I was working in a government office with 100 military and 3,000 civilians, and I saw how many people we're doing the same thing in different branches of this this building. You know, you'd have a, one job and you'd have four different divisions doing the same job and four different people doing that job in four different divisions. That one person could have done that job. You say, why do you have four people doing one person's job? And it's because it was people protecting their jobs, knowing that what they were doing was duplicating, triplicating, and quadruplicating each other's efforts. And you say, what a waste of government resource. You know, when you identify things that are going wrong, then it's, you know, and you report it, and you lose your job or you lose your freedom because you're talking about the truth, because you're reporting the truth, and it makes everybody just want to crawl into a hole and keep their mouth shut. And I think that's what's happened in the United States of America is too many people have crawled into their hole and keep their mouth shut say nothing to buck the system, draw their paycheck, and get drunk in the evening. And, uh, you know, how, shame on us. The Prozac. <laughs> the Prozac <laughs> world, you know, where, you know, 50% of the people are on some kind of antidepressants. And so. I love you talking about world news. I love you talking about Jesus and God. And I love to listen to you. Jamie wants us to give a shout out to Bro Life. These are men that are for life. I'm for B -R -O life. B-R-O-Dash Life. You ought to be a leader of Bro <laughs> Life, <laughs> right? <laughs> I 
miss him so much. This week in the Texas Senate, Bill 6 was signed off on a 21 to 10 vote in favor of the bill. It's known as the bathroom bill. It's just terrible that we're having to have a bill to protect our young granddaughters and daughters. <clears throat> Also in the Texas Senate, they passed Senate Bill 8, written by Senator Dr. Charles Schwertner of Georgetown. <clears throat> it was voted uh, on the 15th with 24 yeses and 6 noes. It prohibits the sale of bodies of aborted babies and outlaws partial birth abortion in Texas. And it now goes to the House. <clears throat> also, there's a House Bill 2858, also known as Senate Bill 1377. Republican Dwayne Burns, a Republican from Cleburne, and Senator Don Buckingham, Republican at Lakeway. It creates criminal penalties <clears throat> for compelling a minor to seek an abortion through force or the threat of force, as well as killing the unborn child of a minor who is being trafficked, trafficked against her will. This legislation will allow the aggressive pr prosecution of this appalling injustice. Also, Senate Bill 77, Senator Jane Nelson, Republican of Flower Mound, Termin this bill terminates parental rights of a parent who sexually assaults their partner. It protects women who are conceived through rape and they choose life and choose to raise their children so that they do not have to co-parent with their rapist after choosing life. It was voted on the 14th. <clears throat> There's also a Senate Bill 25. Uh, Brand Brandon Creighton, he's a Republican from Conroe. This bill removes the wrongful birth cause of action so that parents cannot sue their doctor for failing to recommend abortion for a child who might be born with a disability. Clayton says he wrote this bill because this existing statute allows parents to sue over a child's disability. It sends a message that disability is an injury for which someone should be compensated. He says he feels that every life is of the same value and that is the wrong message to send the way the statute is written. And that was uh, on March 16th this week. <clears throat> So a lot's going on here at the Texas Senate. Oh, we've got a, a picture of, Char of Dr. Charles Shortner. There it is. That was the bill, Senate Bill 8, that's going this week to the House. <clears throat> and also we've got Cruz News. Senator Ted Cruz spoke Monday, uh, and I will just do that clip here at the Senate. He's talking about drug testing rule. In the Senate <clears throat> for passing SJ Riz 23, the legislation that I've introduced that has now passed both houses of Congress, that reigns in yet another example of the Obama administration's executive overreach, that gives power and flexibility to the states, and enables states to deal with the problem of drug use, the epidemic of drug use, and to craft solutions that help people escape addiction and dependence on drugs. This resolution was introduced in the House by Chairman Kevin Brady, a fellow Texan. It passed the House 236 to 189 with bipartisan support. Be in order. The Senate will be in order. Senator from and with the Senate's passage of the resolution, we will now be sending it to President Trump for his signature. This resolution restores congressional intent behind the bipartisan middle class tax relief and Job Creation Act of 2012. That Job Creation Act of 2012 permitted but did not require states to assess state unemployment compensation or insurance program applicants 
for drug usage under two circumstances, where workers had been discharged from their last job because of unlawful drug, drug use, or where workers were looking for jobs and occupations where applicants and employees are subject to drug testing. The wording of the 2012 Job, Job Creation Act clearly demonstrated that Congress intended to provide states the ability to determine how to best implement these plans, and a number of states, including my home state of Texas, did precisely that, establishing testing and programs to help people who had drug dependency and addiction escape from that addiction. However, years after the law's passage, the Obama Department of Labor substantially narrowed the law beyond congressional intent to circumstances where testing is legally required, not where it is merely permitted. That narrow definition undermined congressional intent, it undermined the flexibility of the states, and now, together, we have reversed that interpretation. I commend my colleagues and I thank Chairman Brady for his leadership in the House introducing the resolution. And I commend all of us for restoring the authority of the states. So that happened on Monday. I followed Ted Cruz, Senator Ted Cruz, during the week. And I saw yesterday that he was going to be on Face the Nation at 9.30 this morning. And I was able to say that before the show, so I'm going to show you what he, Ted Cruz spoke on Face the Nation this morning here on the 19th. Welcome to Face the Nation. I'm John Dickerson. We begin this morning with Texas Senator Ted Cruz, who has been working with the White House as a part of that big, fat negotiation the president talked about. Welcome, Senator. I want to get to the negotiation in a minute, but I want to start with uh, the president's reassertion on Friday that mm -hmm. President Obama wiretapped Trump Tower. Intelligence officials, Republicans in, mm -hmm. in Senate and House have said this didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Should the president drop this? Well, these are serious allegations. I, th I think they need to be looked into seriously. You've got open investigations in both the Senate Intelligence Committee and the House Intelligence Committee. You've got next week, FBI Director Comey is testifying. We, we need to find out what the facts are. Um, we do know, or it's at least been publicly reported, that there were two FISA applications for some form of surveillance or wiretaps, one of which was turned down by the, Obama, by the FISA court of the Obama administration, one of which was granted. Um, I think it's important to learn a little bit more detail as to what was contained in those FISA applications, and, and I think the investigations will bring that out. The reason I ask is because there's a lot of questions about whether the president is carrying on something here with kind of his own idea of things. Mm -hmm. You in the campaign went back and forth with the, about the question of veracity. He had, had told stories about your father and JFK's uh, assassination. <laughs> there seemed to be as much evidence for that as there is for this wiretapping claim. Can people trust this president? Well, listen, I, I don't know what basis the president has for these allegations. They're serious allegations. He is now the President of the United States, the Department of Justice, the FBI, the CIA. They all report to him. And, and we should examine what the evidence is. I think it would be quite good for the administration to put forward what evidence there is. I, you know, I will point out that this is not necessarily as outlandish as everyone in the press suggests. We do know that the Obama administration targeted their political enemies. We do know that the IRS, for example, targeted citizens groups who spoke out in defense of the Constitution, who spoke out against Obama. And, and so th the notion is not necessarily outlandish, but it's serious. So it needs to be based on facts. But, we should see what the facts are behind this. But that equivalence, I mean, in this case, he's saying the president of the United States wiretapped him specifically. That is of an order different, isn't it? I, I think we should see the evidence behind it. The, the FISA applications, though, are significant, or at least they could be. I mean, they've been reported publicly in the media. You know, it's not often that the FISA court turns down an application. They usually grant those applications that suggests the application was probably overbroad. It's worth looking at, was there a fishing expedition that the Obama administration was trying to do or, or not? All right, let's move on to health care, big issue, and you are in the thick of trying to yeah. make it better. Yeah. Uh, what is it that you're trying to fix with the health care plan at the Look, moment? The number one issue is premiums. Premiums, premiums, premiums. I, when I'm back home in Texas, what I hear from Texans every single day is I can't afford health insurance, that Obamacare, the average family's premiums, they've risen over $5,000 under Obamacare. That's the central problem. Now, the current House bill, as drafted, I do not believe it will pass the Senate. It doesn't fix the problem. My biggest concern with the House bill is it doesn't lower premiums, and, and CBO, in fact, projected that in the first two years, 
premiums would rise 10 to 20 percent. Although it did say then and they would go down. It, it did, but I got to tell you, if, if Republicans hold a big press conference and pat ourselves on the back that we've repealed Obamacare and everyone's premiums keep going up, people will be ready to tar and feather us in the streets, and quite rightly. Do you think, Senator, the same about that coverage question? 24 million, the CBO said. I, look, the, the, the coverage question, it's actually interrelated to premiums. If premiums keep going up, one of the big problems with Obamacare, people can't afford health insurance. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I did a debate with Bernie Sanders, two-hour town hall on Obamacare. The next day, I was having dinner here in Washington, and two waitresses I know well, they both came up to me and they said, one said, you know what? My premiums have tripled in the last three years. They went from 400 a month to 1200 a month. She said, for the first time in my life, I don't have health insurance. She also said, for the first time in my life, this restaurant put me at under 30 hours a week. They put me at 29.99. I don't have insurance. The second waitress, who I also know well, said she was four months pregnant, and she had just gotten a notification from her insurance that the doctor that she likes and trusts can't deliver her baby because he's not covered. So how do you We've fix it? got to fix that. We can do that in the House bill. But the only way to drive down premiums is we need to repeal the insurance mandates. There are 12 insurance mandates that are in Obamacare. The House bill only touches two of them. We need to repeal those mandates to drive down cost. We need to allow purchases across state lines. We need to allow association health plans. And we need to allow people to pay premiums from health savings accounts, all of those will make it much more affordable for people to get health insurance. The president and the House Speaker say that's going to happen. It's going to be a two-step process. First, the American Health Care Act goes through, and then the second set of legislation comes on. You're, you're, you're chuckling. That, 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 that ain't going to happen. It's their so-called three-bucket solution, which is all the good stuff is in bucket three. Bucket three takes eight Democrats. Right now, Senate Democrats are opposing everything. You can't get eight Senate Democrats to agree on saying good morning. Anything in bucket three, I, I've called bucket three the sucker's bucket. And what I have been urging the president and the administration and leaders in both houses, take everything in bucket three, put it in bucket one. We've got to actually fix this problem. Their argument is that you can't do it all in this, what you're calling bucket one in the American Health Care Act that Paul Ryan and the president support because the rules of the Senate just will not allow it. And so that you're, that's what you're up against here. But that's fundamentally false. The rules of the Senate, we're on what's called budget reconciliation. It's governed by the Budget Act votes. of 1974. It lays out a test for what's permissible on reconciliation. Six-part test. The central part of the test is, is it budgetary in nature? If it's budgetary in nature, you can do it. If it's not, you can't. You look at the insurance mandates. They impact billions of dollars of federal spending. And I'll point out the Obama Justice Department went before the U.S. Supreme Court twice and argued the mandates are integrally related. They're intertwined with the subsidies. You cannot sever them under the statute. We can do this now in bucket one. And, and if we don't, this bill doesn't pass. And if it doesn't pass, it, it's a, a substantive and political disaster for everyone. Involved. If it doesn't have, the, have these reforms about the mandates in it in the Senate bill, will you not vote for it? I, I cannot vote for any bill that keeps premiums rising. Here's I, the... I, Texans have, have, look, there has been no issue I've devoted more time and energy to than Obamacare stopping this disaster. We have a chance for an incredible substantive win for the American people. And I got to tell you, I, I am spending night and day meeting with House members, meeting with senators, meeting with the administration. Just yesterday, I spent three hours at Mar-a-Lago with, with Mike Lee and with Mark Meadows negotiating with the president's team, trying to fix this bill. Does the president get this? I, we have had multiple conversations. The, the vice president and I have had multiple conversations. As, as he said on what you played a minute ago, President Trump said, this is one big fat negotiation. Here's the central prize. If we lower premiums, and hopefully lower them a lot, that's a victory for the American people. If premiums keep going up, that's a victory for insurance companies and lobbyists, but it's a loss for the people who elected us. Uh, we've got very little time. I want to get to the Supreme Court, but does the president get your central point that this has to be moved all into one, one thing, one approach? I, I think that with the president right now is listening to the arguments all right. on all sides. He wants to get to yes, and I want to get to yes, but we've got to actually solve the problem. That's my focus right 30 now. 30 seconds on the Supreme Court nominee, uh, Judge Gorsuch. Is it going to be filibuster, do you think, and what will Republicans do? I, you know, I think it's 50-50 whether the Democrats filibuster. They don't have any good arguments against Gorsuch, but they're are furious that, that we're going to have a conservative nominated and confirmed. I'll tell you this, Judge Gorsuch will be confirmed. He will either get 60 votes and be confirmed or otherwise, whatever pre procedural steps are necessary, 
I believe within a month or two, Neil Gorsuch will be an associate justice of the Supreme Court. So Republicans will go that far if, some, if Democrats do filibuster. Uh, Mitch McConnell has said we will do whatever is necessary. A Democratic filibuster will not succeed. I agree with the leader. All right, All right Senator Cruz, thank you so much. You know, I'm so excited that I am doing this live show and that I'm able to report what our Senator Ted Cruz is doing here in the United States. You know, he's a man of integrity. I've followed him since 2005, and uh, I just think what he is doing is wonderful. I wish he was our president, but he's a top leader right now, and he's working hard for us. Also, I have a video from Senator Ted Cruz when he spoke at the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. He's mainly talking about economic growth. Absolutely wonderful clip here. Cruz of Texas. In 2012, the senator was elected as the 34th U.S. Senator from Texas. His calling to public service is inspired largely by his family's pursuit of the American dream. His mother was born in Delaware, and she became the first in her family to graduate from college with a degree in mathematics. And she became a pioneering computer programmer in the 1950s. Senator Cruz's father immigrated to this country from Cuba in 1957 after he fought in the revolution and was imprisoned and tortured. He fled to Texas in 1957 without a penny to his name and not speaking a word of English. He washed dishes for 50 cents an hour, helping him to pay his way through the University of Texas and start a small business in the oil and gas industry. The Cruz family history is such a great story. It gets to the heart of what this summit and this country is all about. I am sure many of you remember seeing T Senator Cruz when he won the Iowa primary, thanking both his mother and father for succeeding and living the American dream. Speaking of the American dream, Senator Cruz himself graduated with honors from Princeton University and with high honors from Harvard Law School. He served as the first Hispanic law clerk to Chief Justice William Rehnquist on the U.S. Supreme Court. And other than those credentials, he hasn't accomplished much in his academic career. In the U.S. Senate, Senator Cruz serves on many important committees, including the Commerce, Science, and Transportation, Armed Services, and Judiciary Committees, and the Committee on Rules and Administration, and the Joint Economic Committee. It has been my distinct pleasure to work with Senator Cruz on the Commerce Committee, and I can attest to the Senator's work ethic, his principled commitment to the issues, and his integrity on following through on things that he believes in and that he articulates. Over the past two years, as Senator Cruz campaigned to be the Republican presidential nominee, he traveled tirelessly across the country to meet with small business owners and entrepreneurs. In April 2015, he was the first candidate to participate in the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce candidate Q&A forum. So he is no stranger to this audience. He is no stranger to this community. He is no stranger to this organization. Please join me in welcoming back to the stage, back to the U.S. Hispanic Chamber, a true friend of Hispanic businesses nationwide, Senator Ted Cruz. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, David, for the very, very kind introduction. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, it is great to be back with so many friends at the Hispanic Chamber. Uh, and I want to thank each of you for your leadership, for your leadership here in our nation's capital and all across the country, your leadership fighting for small businesses, your leadership fighting for jobs and economic growth. It makes a real difference. I can tell you in the Senate, my number one priority is jobs and economic growth. And the reason for that is simple. That's the number one priority of the Texans I represent. As I travel the state, I try to do small business roundtables all across Texas. 
and consistently in every community, whether East or West Texas, whether the Panhandle or down in the Valley, the number one priority of Texans, we want to see jobs, we want to see opportunity, we want to see wages rising, we want to see a better future for our kids. And that is what the Hispanic Chamber exists to fight for, exists to champion. So I thank you for what you're doing both in your private sector capacity of creating those jobs, of providing that opportunity, but also in your public capacity of interacting with government and, and supporting policies that create an environment where jobs can flourish. You know, when we think about opportunity in this country, most of us tend to think about our own family stories. David made reference to that, about the journey up the economic ladder. In my family, I think about my dad arriving in Austin in 1957. He was 18 at the time. And he'd been in prison and tortured in Cuba. When he got to Austin, he didn't know anybody. He took a ferry over to Key West. He took a Greyhound bus from Key West to Austin. He didn't know anybody. He had $100 sewn into his underwear. And his very first job was washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour. Now, why did he get that job? It was real simple. He couldn't speak English. You didn't have to speak English to wash dishes. You had to take a dish, put it under hot water, and scrub it. He could do that in any language. Now, very soon thereafter, my dad learned English. Part of the reason he, he had a fairly acute incentive to learn English, in that he was enrolled as a freshman at UT. His classes were all in English. And if he didn't learn English, he was going to flunk his classes. And if he flunked his classes, he would lose his student visa. And if he lost his student visa, he'd be sent back to Cuba, and they'd kill him. So that gave a, a fairly exquisite incentive to learn English so that he could stay in America. And, and in fact, one of the things my dad did, he signed up for Spanish 101. He signed up for Spanish 101 and then he reverse engineered the class. So when the professor was up there saying milk is leche, he would write down, okay, leche is milk. And he'd just try to do it backwards on everything that was coming. Well, fairly soon my dad's English got pretty good. And his next job was at that same restaurant as a cook. He got hired as a cook and he made 80 cents an hour. Now, 80 cents an hour was better than 50. He liked being a cook a lot better than being a dishwasher. His next job after that, he got hired as a research assistant and a teaching assistant at the University of Texas teaching math. And then his next job from there was at IBM as a computer programmer. And then he and my mom went on to start a small business a seismic data processing business in the, in the oil and gas industry. Now that's a story I suspect that is familiar to just about everyone here, that all of us, I mean, it's one of the amazing things about this country, that we share that common journey. And a point that I try to make often when thinking about economic policies, I think our economic policies need to focus the most on the first and second and third rungs on the, of the economic ladder, on the beginning of ascending to prosperity. Because if my dad hadn't gotten that first job washing dishes making 50 cents an hour, he doesn't get the second job making 80 cents an hour, he doesn't get the next job teaching, and he doesn't get hired by IBM or start his business. If you knock people off of the rung of economic opportunity early on, it strips their entire future. Now, where do jobs and economic growth come from? What folks here understand is that jobs and economic growth, they come from the private sector, they come from entrepreneurs putting capital at risk, and they come from small businesses. Two-thirds of all new jobs come from small businesses. If you want to see more jobs and economic growth, there's a tried and true method, which is from the government side, regulatory reform and tax reform. Every time in history we've reduced the burdens on small businesses and job producers, the result has been incredible economic growth. And I will tell you where the time we're at right now, it is a time of change. It is a time in Washington where the entire city is changing. And I have to tell you, in Texas at least, as I meet with business leaders, there is an excitement, there is an enthusiasm in the business community that I haven't heard a long time. I believe we are poised for 2017 for this to be the most productive Congress in decades. Now, we could easily screw it up. But if we actually deliver on what we promised, 
I think we could have a tremendous impact on the economy. I think there are four major things I believe we're going to accomplish in 2017. First, and what we're in the middle of right now, is repealing Obamacare. Now that has been a central campaign promise for six years. I can tell you when I do small business roundtables in Texas, over and over and over again, small business owners tell me Obamacare is the single biggest challenge they face in their business. That it's forcing millions of Americans into part-time work. It's forcing millions of small businesses to stay under 50 employees. Obamacare, repealing it and then replacing it with patient-centered reforms that increase competition, that increase choices, that drive down costs and give you, the patient, control over your health care without government getting between you and your doctor. That's what we need to be doing. Now, getting there is not going to be easy. We are in the middle of active debates within the House of Representatives, between the House and the Senate, with the administration. The House has a current bill that personally I don't think gets the job done. I think we need more work on the House bill, and so I'm working very, very hard with my colleagues in both houses and with the administration to improve that bill. And what I think is critically important to see in health care reform is reforms that drive down costs. The number one cause of people being so frustrated and angry with Obamacare is that premiums keep skyrocketing. All over Texas, I hear people who say, I can't afford health insurance anymore. The average family's premiums have increased over $5,000 a year. If we're going to do this and do this right, we've got to repeal the government mandates that are driving premiums through the roof so that people can afford to have quality health care for their families. That's the first task before us. It is not going to be easy to get there, but I believe failure is not an option that we have to get it done, and so I'm working very, very hard to try to bring people together to get us to yes, to get us to a real repeal, and a repeal that drives down premiums so that health care is affordable for people who need it. A second major priority item in 2017 is reg reform. I have to tell you just about every cabinet member that has sat down with me, the first words out of their mouth are reg reform. By all indications, this administration's commitment to reg reform is real, it is genuine, it is passionate. And what I would encourage each of you, my office is working very, very closely with the administration, the White House, and every cabinet agency. I would ask each of you to go back to your businesses and brainstorm with your teams what government policies, what government regulations, if repealed or modified, would have the single biggest impact on your bottom line, would have the single biggest impact on productivity, on job creation, on wages. One of the things that is promising about this new administration is this president wants to be bold. Boldness is a good characteristic in a president, and when it comes to reg reform, I can tell you this administration is asking me and my office for specific ideas where they should focus their attention to get bang for the buck. And so I encourage each of you to reach out to me directly. I would love your good, positive ideas on how we can create more and more jobs and, and jumpstart the economy. A third area that I think is likely to move in 2017 is tax reform. Tax reform is likely to move this summer or fall. I think we will see fundamental tax reform. Now, at this point, the details of tax reform are still very much up in the air. There's a House plan. It's being hotly debated. There are different views in the Senate. There are different views in the administration. As I stand here today, I can't tell you what tax reform specifically will include. I can tell you the advice that I've given the president is two words, bold and simple. I think there is power to bold simplicity, to dramatically simplifying the tax code, to reducing the burdens, reducing the paperwork, making the tax code simple and fair. And my view is that the odds are very high we're going to get tax reform accomplished, meaningful, real tax reform. And the fourth thing that I think we're going to get done in 2017 is confirming a strong conservative justice to replace Antonin Scalia on the Supreme Court. Now, I got to say, if we get those four done, 
If we repeal Obamacare, if we get reg reform, if we get fundamental tax reform and confirm a strong justice all in one year, 2017 will be a blockbuster year. Now, there are a lot of risks. It is not easy stitching together a coalition to get over the finish line. But I'm encouraged because if we do all of that, the impact on each of your businesses should be profound. The impact in our objective should be millions and millions of new jobs. It should be wages rising. It should be expanded opportunity for the next generation of kids like my dad, washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour, but with dreams of a better life. If the economy is booming, every other problem we have is solvable. If you want to rebuild the military, if you want to strengthen and, and, and preserve Social Security and Medicare, if you want to improve health care or education, all of those derive from economic growth. And I believe we've been given an historic opportunity to implement policies that will facilitate economic growth, facilitate small businesses growing. And so I'm energized and excited to have that opportunity. And so I want to close the way I open simply by saying to each of you, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for fighting to expand opportunity. The opportunity that in the Hispanic community, we are a profoundly entrepreneurial community. The American dream is what unifies the Hispanic community. And thank you for fighting for making sure the American dream is real for this generation and for generations to come. Thank you very much. <laughs> a lot of people want to ask why I share so much of Ted Cruz news is nobody else is doing it, especially in the Austin area. We need to know what our senator is doing and uh, and what he, how he's fighting for us and what he's saying. Another clip I have is on Wednesday at 1 o'clock, Senator Ted Cruz and Senator Mike Lee and Senator Rand Paul spoke at the Freedom Works Health Care Rally at the Senate Park in D.C. Senator Cruz says he, we need to be bold and simple. These are the only three senators that are really speaking up for doing more than what this Republican bill is that uh, President Trump is wanting. So this is a 10 minute clip and we'll come back. Cruise. God bless each and every one of you. Now let me say, we have provided for our friends in the media definitive proof that the election of conservatives across the federal government has ended global warming. <laughs> of course, that's liable to make the media even more ornery because if there had been a Democrat, we would have apparently had global warming and they would have been in shorts enjoying the hot weather. I want to say to you guys, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for braving the cold. And thank you for standing up and fighting for freedom. <laughs> Every one of you, this victory is your victory. In November, Democrats were shocked. The media was shocked, although I repeat myself. <laughs> and millions of hardworking men and women across this country rose up and said, enough is enough, and we have a mandate for change. And I stand here today incredibly optimistic and energized. We have the opportunity to do an enormous amount of good. Now, we could screw it up. We could very easily screw it up. But I believe we're poised for this to be the most productive Congress in decades. And there are four big things on the agenda for 2017 
the first and the most important is we must honor our promise and repeal Obamacare. <laughs> For six years, Republicans have campaigned over and over and over again saying, if only you give us the House, we'll repeal Obamacare. If only you give us the Senate, we'll repeal Obamacare. If only you give us the White House, we'll repeal Obamacare. Well, you know what? We're out of excuses. The time for talk is over. Now is the time for action. And I got to tell you, I think failure is not an option. If Republicans take this opportunity and blow it, we will rightly be considered a laughing stock. So we can't do that. And I'll tell you, the leaders who've been here, the leaders who've been addressing you today have been on the front lines fighting to take the House plan, which has a lot of problems, and to try to make it real repeal that lowers premiums, that gives you control over your health care. I believe we can get it done. I can tell you in the last week, four days, I've been at the White House meeting with the president, with the vice president, with the administration, with House members, with senators, saying we have got to get it done. And with your support, y'all are here to talk to your elected representatives. The most important message for all of us to hear from you is we've got to deliver on our promises. We need real repeal. And the test for success is going to be premiums. You look at why people are frustrated with Obamacare, there are a lot of reasons, but the biggest reason is that premiums have skyrocketed and people can't afford their health care. Barack Obama promised the average family's premiums would drop $2,500 a year. In fact, the average family's premiums have risen $5,000 a year. That's what I hear over and over again from Texans. We can't afford quality health care for our kids, for our family. The test for a Republican repeal of Obamacare is do we drive down premiums? Do we make health care more affordable for the American people? We can do that, but only if we repeal the Obamacare insurance mandates. The mandates are what are driving premiums through the roof. We've got to repeal them, and we've got to repeal them now. A second critical element before us in 2017 is regulatory reform. Just about every single cabinet member I've met with, among the very first words out of their mouth have been reg reform. I believe this administration's commitment on reg reform is real, it is genuine, and if there's one thing that we can all agree on about this president, he wants to be bold. And I am, I will tell you of all of the issues I'm perhaps most optimistic about reg reform, I think we're going to see, we've already seen the beginnings of it, and I think over the rest of the year, we're going to see job-killing regulations that are hammering small businesses repealed and taken off the books. A third critical issue is tax reform. I believe we will pass fundamental tax reform either this summer or this fall. Now, the details of that are still up in the air, but I'll tell you what I'm urging the president. I'm urging two words, bold and simple. There is power in bold simplicity. Ideally, I'd like to see a simple flat tax and abolish the IRS. Now, some people in Washington say, gosh, that, that's a little extreme. They say, you know, shouldn't we just maybe decrease the top marginal rate to 37.95%? 
Well, let me ask you something. Is that any more radical or extreme or any more surprising to Washington than electing Donald Trump as president? The voters have given us a bold mandate for change. We have a Republican in the White House. We have Republicans in every agency of government. We have Republican majorities in both houses of Congress. How about we act like it? And the fourth major issue we're going to tackle is we are going to confirm Judge Neil Gorsuch to the U.S. Supreme Court. The confirmation hearings start next week. I fully expect to see Democrats lighting their hair on fire. They may actually literally light their hair on fire. I expect them to scream and yell and do everything they can to impugn the good judge's integrity. But I expect next week also the American people are going to see a judge, a principled constitutionalist, who will follow the law, who will uphold the Bill of Rights, who will uphold free speech, who will uphold religious liberty, who will uphold the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, who will keep his oath to the Constitution and to defend the people of the United States of America. And you know what? If we do all of that, if we repeal Obamacare, if we see fundamental reg reform, if we see fundamental tax reform, and we confirm a strong conservative to the Supreme Court, 2017 will be a blockbuster year. So every one of you can turn to your neighbor and say thank you. Because it is each of you that got us here to where we are today, that put us in a position to recapture the country. And it is each of you that is holding us accountable to keep our promise, to defend liberty, to defend the Constitution, and to defend the United States of America. Thank you, and God bless you. <laughs> he just he just this lights me up, <laughs> and I love the the comment he made about the lit, some Democrats were literally put their hair on fire, <laughs> which reminds me of a clip that I saw with uh, Pokey the Trailer Park Show. His son has a fan bo boy, and they were uh, some of the crew were at the downtown. Uh, talking to people on St. Patrick's Day, young people that said that St. Patrick was white supremacist and we should ban St. Patrick's Day because they had no idea what the truth is on St. Patrick. He led people to Jesus Christ more than any place else in Ireland. I mean, he was, and he was imprisoned so many times <laughs> and they were saying all this stuff and, and these youth were believing anything they said so it just just blows me away my last clip today is on live talk with mark crutcher and renee hobbs it was just uh, i believe on thursday that they did this uh, video and then right after our show at two o'clock we'll have some more live talk with Ma mark crutcher and Renee Hobbs. And at six o'clock on Monday, we'll have a JCI Live rerun. And, set, and of course, seven o'clock and eight o'clock on Channel 10 is the Trailer Park Show and Right Talk with Mark. Uh, right Talk with Mike Lee. And at seven o'clock on Friday, Prophecies of Hope will be airing here. So I'll see you next week. This clip here is Life Talk. If, sure. if I can, on uh, Tucker uh, Carlson the other night, he um, had interviewed the Vice President, Dawn LeGuin, if I'm saying her name right, um, and she will not admit Vice that, President of Planned Parenthood. Uh, Vice President of Planned Parenthood, yes. And she will not admit that abortion is killing a human life. And she is dodging the question, and she's saying that it's, um, it's a woman's right to choose. It's a woman's right to choose. Well, you know what? That woman's right to choose is, is killing a baby that has a totally separate DNA, blood type, 
different sex, I mean, or, you know, possibly different sex. I mean, half the time. Half the time, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that is the most ridiculous well, argument. She would not answer that question. Yeah, that's the, that's the issue. And he had Jamo Green on there, a Democratic operative, mm -hmm. a raging pro board, godless degenerate. Uh, has always projected herself as this good Christian, young black Christian woman. Right. She's a liar. She's a bald-faced liar. Um, but he keeps hammering on them and saying, Tell, do you believe that the unborn, mm -hmm. is, the, is the unborn child a separate entity or is there just nothing here? Right. Are they living human beings right. or not? And they will not answer they that won't. question. No, and you know what the funny thing about it is? Is the abortionist, the doers, as you would say, will answer that question. They will openly admit that they're killing a baby. Absolutely. And, and that the abortionist that was pregnant that did the abortion on the... 18-week baby. Yes. And, and she's she 18 has, weeks. And she's 18 weeks and she assembled the baby herself after she aborted it in the Petri dish. I mean, and how? said that she did it so she could see what her baby looked like. Yeah, exactly. I mean, how demented do you have to be? How sick are these people? Yeah. But, hey, Mark Solo. But you're right in that it's the the doers right. who will admit, the people who work in the abortion clinics, right. they will come right out and admit that they're taking a human life. Yeah. I mean, they'll say it. Yes, it's a living human being. We know that. We can't pull these little arms and legs out of these women all day long and not know what they are. Right. Well, and it's the talkers that are the, the PR. They have to present right. this as... The, the talkers like the people from Planned Parenthood or this JMO, JMO Green degenerate that, that Tucker Carlson had on a couple of nights ago. Yeah. Um, they can't afford to admit, yes, it's a living human being. Right. Because then the next, they know what the next question is going to be. Yeah. Well, then how can you justify killing them? Yeah. Right. That's, That's where right. we are. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we've got to do a better job, and, and we're, we're looking at some projects here at Life Dynamics to put together some videos and some other things that are going to help you guys out in the field hold these people's feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. Because they are really clever at diverting attention away from what the central issue is. Yeah. And, and they're, not even, they're not even subtle about it anymore. Right. I mean, uh, on those things that you're talking about with Tucker Carlson going up against this one from Planned Parenthood, and he went up against some some Democratic Congress nuisance from California a few weeks ago and then against this Jammu Green. Mm -hmm. And he keeps, keeps hammering him, saying, is there nothing there? Is, is the unborn child anything at all? Is it a separate entity from right. the mother? You know, is it different than the mother? Is it, yeah. what's there? Is there, any, is there nothing there? And they'll always deflect and go off to yeah. some other direction. Eventually, they're just going to quit coming on there yeah. because they look like idiots. Well, yeah, I mean, and that's the same rhetoric that they used um, not long ago that it's safe, legal, and rare, and they took out the rare took part. Took out the rare part. They don't right. care if it's rare or not. Yeah. And they never did. Oh, they yeah. never did care if it was safe, legal, and rare. Money. And they don't really care if it's safe. The big issue here is legal. Right. That's all that matters. That's right. Because the minute that you try to pass laws to make it safer, mm -hmm. they're the ones who fight it. They yeah. fight it tooth and nail. Oh, right. Yes, so they do. the safe, legal, and rare was an argument, was a lie. All they care about is the legal. Yeah. As long as a baby dies, that's all they care about. Yep. Anyway, we're out of time. We um, are. And um, if you guys want to uh, subscribe to Life Talk, um, just go to YouTube and you can subscribe on our channel um, at lifetalktv.com or our website, lifetalktv.com. And um, also be sure you post your questions and comments so we can get those answered if anybody is curious about anything. Right. 